Hello, everyone, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Susan Friday. I'm the deputy head of the OECD Washington Center, and I'd like to offer a warm welcome to all of you for joining us today for this briefing. Um, here at the OECD Washington Center, we are the liaison office to the United States and Canada, and we act as a resource for policymakers and policy shapers and other influencers, government, government officials, business groups, labor groups, the academic community, the think tank community, the list goes on and on. And among the important resources we provide to those communities are our economic surveillance products, as well as the kinds of briefings that we're having today to share the latest shared economic knowledge, data, and best practices. Before I welcome back our great speakers from the OECD's economics department, I wanna just mention, mention a couple of housekeeping items for our attendees today. If you haven't already seen the Outlook, you can get it at oe.cd slash economic outlook, all lowercase letters, or you can find OECD Washington on Twitter and look for the tweets that you see about today's event and you'll find your way to the report as well. For those of you who might want to chime in with a question of your own today, we're using a Q&A feature. You can use this to ask questions to our presenters and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. And one of my colleagues will be monitoring those questions as they come in. So please do feel free to use the uh, chat to ask your questions through the Q&A module. We are also recording today's presentation and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with links to the archive presentation if you want to share it or uh, take another look later at what you've seen. With that, I'm getting ready to turn over to our experts. First, I'm going to pass over to Sebastian Barnes, head of the division at the economic department that oversees many countries, among them the United States. Sebastian is going to provide a global scene setting based on the findings of the report. And then his colleagues, Ben Westmore and Alvaro Leandro from the US desk will take over to take us into more detail about the impacts um, for the United States and taking a longer view on what we see from the outlook. So with that, I'm going to pass on over to Sebastian. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Susan. It's great to be here. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. It, it's, uh, it's great to join you this afternoon from Paris. Uh, we're going to be presenting on the OECD Economic Outlook for, no in no for November, which came out uh, last week. The title is Confronting the Crisis, because we are facing uh, a very difficult situation, particularly in Europe, if we go into the winter. So the world is coping with a very large energy shock. This chart shows the estimated share of GDP spent on, on energy for the OECD. You can see that we're essentially facing the same the shock on the same scale as the one we saw in the early 1970s. And of course, if you look at the level, typically we've been spending around 10% of our GDP on energy. That's now soaring to around 18%. So that's a massive transfer of resources within our countries, but also between our countries. And given the OECD is a net importer of energy, that's a big transfer between the rich countries of the OECD uh, and other parts of the world, particularly the commodity producers. So this is a huge shock the economy is facing. As we know, the way that's intensified has been through higher inflation. Many countries are facing the highest rate of inflation. Uh, they've had for over a generation, and that follows a long period where inflation has been extremely low. The beginning that was partly driven by pan things happening coming out of the pandemic, the fact that we had higher transport costs, there's a lot of pent up demand uh, coming from the pandemic, but then that really exploded through energy prices. Uh, and that's what you can see in these greasing bars that represent inflation about a year ago. You can see that the inflation has now become much more broad based, that in many countries, more than half of goods have increased by more than 6% over the past year. And that ref partly reflects the fact that energy is so pervasive in the things that we consume, the things that we buy, but also reflects the fact that there are other inflationary pressures, partly coming out from those earlier demand pressures, but also induced by the higher energy prices. So we see inflation is kind of showing up everywhere, and I think that matches probably our everyday experience as consumers. At the same time, we see that labour markets have remained very tight. Activity has actually been very strong in the early part of this year in most countries, partly a boost coming out of the pandemic, but also just reflecting actually a lot of pent up demand. And we see that shown up in the labor market. Unemployment rates are extremely low in almost all OECD countries. As we've seen in America, there are very high vacancies per number uh, or the, the ratio of vacancies to unemployed, the number of unemployed shows a very uh, tight labor market at the moment. Uh, so there are really strong pressures in the labor market. We expect that to weaken a little bit as demand weakens, but this is still a, a, a labor market where labor is scarce and where there's pressure on wages. And of course that partly reflects our aging society. 
the same time, and this is what will matter to many people, the most real wages have fallen in most economies, often very significantly. And that's because the wage increases that people had didn't anticipate this huge surge in inflation. So in many countries you see people expect, facing uh, real wage losses of three or four percent. That largely translates into falls in disposable income. So even if, even if we aren't in a recession, to many people, this feels like a recession because their purchasing power has taken an extremely strong hit. Uh, you know, we're really on a crisis situation from the way most people would be experiencing it. And of course, we now expect global growth to slow. That slowdown was partly anticipated as we got out of this very strong period uh, of coming out of the pandemic. But we see that actually these blue, this is contributions to global growth. We see that 2023 will be a very weak year uh, for global growth, around 2%. And that growth is almost entirely coming from Asia. Um, very little is coming from North America and from Europe. And that reflects the, this impact on people's purchasing powers uh, from higher inflation. If you look at our projections in more detail, uh, you can see for 2022, there's a somewhat mixed picture. This partly reflects the strength of recovery varying earlier in the year. But you see for 2023 is marked by these red triangles. We've revised our forecast down again, uh, basically across, across all economies. And we're getting quite low growth rates. Some countries are already expected to be in recession in 2023 and many others are not far away from it. Of course, emerging countries, typic economies, typically growing slow, uh, more strongly than advanced economies. But again, we see there's a slowdown and a down in provision, even for many of these economies. And at the same time, we expect inflation will remain high, but it will moderate. So we're expecting, again, these very exceptionally high rates of inflation to carry through to 2023. That partly reflects energy prices. We've already seen but it partly reflects this broadening of inflationary pressures uh, that's underway in the economy. We put those two things together. We expect a, a slowing of inflation in 2023. And by 2024, partly res, as a result of monetary policy tightening, inflation comes down to more normal levels. Uh, but won't be down at the kind of levels that we've seen over recent years. So we're forecasting a slowdown in growth and high inflation to stay. Looking at some of the risks and vulnerabilities and issues around this, um, in Europe this winter, of course, the main risk remains around energy shortages. Now, we know that actually in, we're in a relatively good position, that the, the, the storage has been filled, that, that new solutions have been found in the short run. There's some capacity to reduce demand as well. Uh, but, but we now think a lot more about the following winter, 23, 24, where it's going to be very difficult to replenish those gas supplies that's so important for Europe without having a supply uh, of Russian gas to do that. So this shows a number of scenarios. You can see under two of the scenarios we show, including a cold winter this year, that we could be below the kind of critical threshold uh, in terms of the risks of supply shortages. So these issues, both gas in Europe and the commodity prices in more, more general, remain very volatile and very tense in this current situation. Another aspect of the situation is the change in financial conditions. We've had this reversal of the monetary policy cycle that, that started. We saw that countries have been raising interest rates at really a very, very sharp uh, pace because of the increase in inflation. Of course, the corollary of that has been a weakening of financial markets, but also some firms and some consumers are now facing much higher debt service costs, particularly in those countries with flexible uh, variable rate mortgages, and particularly in those parts of the corporate sector, for example, some parts of the US economy, uh, where uh, a lot of borrowers are relatively highly leveraged. In terms of what policy should need to, needs to do, I think there are really two important goals that we emphasize in this report. One is that we are going to have to accelerate the energy transition. We needed to do that anyway because of climate change. Uh, but obviously, with the shortage of supply, we're having to accelerate those efforts. This shows two different estimates of how much investment uh, is required. That's a massive increase in investment that, that's required, some of it in energy supply, some of it in efficiency. Uh, we're massively behind this. So this is going to require policies to support it. It's going to require a huge reallocation of resources. Uh, and it's going to require a big step up both in public and private investment. So this is a really big and now very urgent challenge for many countries. On the other side, more of a long term challenge, but something that we've seen partly exacerbated by recent trends uh, is the rise of protectionism or policies that the, the country's put in place, maybe for good reasons, but which have the consequences uh, of frustrating trade. Uh, and, and these have a potentially large impact on the economy. Uh, this shows one ex exercise that shows potential losses to, 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 um, uh, to output as a result of these kinds of policies. So it is very important as people craft uh, policy responses in these very difficult times uh, to keep aware that open markets still do bring competition, they still do provide 
uh, access to other resources and it's very important to easy supply constraints and keeping open markets. So to summarize that very briefly, on the macro side, man monetary policy needs to continue to tighten the fight in inflation. There's been a huge tightening already, but central banks need to stay the course to make sure we don't have these second round inflation effects, we don't have wages and prices increasing further because wages and prices have already increased. Fiscal policy needs to continue to provide the kind of supports that we've seen it provide in many countries, but this support needs to be much better targeted to improve that trade-off between, between protecting people who legitimately do need to be protected and not triggering any second round uh, inflation effects. And of course, many countries have relatively high public debt by historical standards. In terms of the energy crisis, as we discussed, we need to increase uh, the supply of energy and we need to increase energy security, uh, partly by energy savings and supply diversification, and ultimately by investing more in clean technologies and clean energy. Uh, and in terms of structural policies to boost growth, to raise people's incomes when we've been under so much pressure, we need to keep international trade open. Uh, there's a lot of gains that we have in some countries for bringing more women into the workforce and we need to invest in skills partly as we have an aging population and a number of pressures that have come from the long-term costs of the pandemic that's the global overview and we're going to turn over to my colleague ben westmore who's going to give you the picture from the u.s perspective okay thanks thanks very much sebastian um i'll talk a little bit about recent u.s economic developments and then step through the projections for the u.s so a bit more specifically than, than the global outline that sebastian just gave so i think the first point is that throughout 2022 and this has been apparent in the official statistics that gdp growth has been quite modest we saw in the first half of the year uh declines in gdp growth a, a contraction uh in q3 growth was modest and what we're seeing here is that in, in Q4, we expect to see mo relatively modest growth again, as a small positive growth number. Uh, we don't so far see a collapse in activity that some were anticipating. There are di different ways to look at this with regard to the high frequency indicators. Throughout the pandemic, we put some work into developing a weekly GDP tracker that combines machine learning techniques and Google Trends data to give some indication as to economic activity at high frequency, so on a weekly basis. And you can see here from the blue line um, that this tracks the quarterly official estimates of GDP growth relatively closely, which are the red dots. And in recent months, we've seen GDP growth on a weekly basis rising a little, um, but uh, and certainly not collapsing. So the second thing to say is when we think about what's happening in Europe at the moment and the war in Ukraine, the US's direct exposure through trade to the war is relatively limited. And you can see here on the left-hand side that direct trade exposure through either direct uh, exports to Russia that serve Russian final demand or that serve to be inputs into Russian exports are relatively limited for the US. This partly reflects the fact that US, the US is a net energy exporter. And we've actually seen that a pickup in demand for, for as sort of global trade has been reconfigured as a result of the war. The global demand for some commodities out of the US, such as natural gas and some rural commodities such as wheat, have picked up in recent months. The domestic economy, though, hasn't been immune from the impact of, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. You can see this both in food prices in, in, in the US, but also in gasoline prices. Uh, the right hand side figure there shows uh, gasoline prices in the US picking up quite sharply after that February 20 invasion of Ukraine. Fortunately, in recent months, since the middle of the year, gasoline prices have fallen back and we now see them as only being slightly above where they were prior to the invasion. So uh, consumers, when we think about the volume of consumer goods being consumed by households, they've risen relatively modestly through 2022 as well. However, they're spending a lot more on consumption items, and that can be highlighted here in terms of the difference between that orange line, which is nominal personal consumption expenditure in the US, and the blue line, which is real personal consumption expenditure or the volume of, of goods being consumed. And so through the early parts of the pandemic, you can see these two lines track to each other more quite closely. But as inflation started to rise really sharply, that we see that the personal consumption expenditures in nominal terms have increased very, very sharply, whereas they've been very stable in volume terms. It's true in the US as well, and you would have seen this from Sebastian's cross-country chart of around the labor market. There, there is 
uh, a very tight labour market in the US and that continues to be the case, even though the growth hasn't been especially strong through 2022. The strong output recovery as a result of the pandemic has moved the unemployment rate back to what is consistent with full employment or even below what we say is consistent with full employment. Uh, and the unemployment rate is now at a level that is at the lowest level in history in the history of this series and back to where it was pre-pandemic, very tight labour markets. Job openings uh, are also have come down in the last few months, but we still see them being around those peaks that we saw around the middle of the year that are at the highest level that they've been in the history of this series since the early 2000s. The gap on the right-hand side figure here between the blue line and the red line is broadly interpreted as labour shortages or the degree of labour shortages in the economy. And you can see here that this gap still remains very large. You know, that partly reflects the very sharp recovery, so the very sharp response in labour demand is following the pandemic, but also on the supply side, and Sebastian alluded to this, the ageing of the population would have resulted in a decline in the labour force participation rate in any case. Um, on top of that, we're still seeing some reluctance or some weakness in terms of the flows of older workers back into the labour force compared to that flow prior to the pandemic. So the labour force participation rate in the US is still relatively low compared to where it was in early 2020. One thing that we can say about this kind of sharp recovery and this sharp recovery in the labour market is it doesn't seem to have left much scarring. The downturn doesn't seem to have left much scarring in the labour market compared to the period after the financial crisis. So when we look at the long term unemployed following the, that 2008, 2009 shock, it took a long time to try and reintegrate those people that have moved into unemployment back into the labour market. And that was highlighted by this kind of continued high stock of the un long term unemployed that took many years to, to decrease. In this episode, we saw a big increase in the, in the long term unemployed through 2020 uh, and, and moving into 2021, but that's really come down very sharply. And so that's also, it's also been the case when we look at the labour market experience of minorities, and we know that this has been a real focus of the administration that following the, 2000, the, the financial crisis, that we saw that Latino and Hispanics and Black and African Americans employment rates as share of the population declined relative to the, the white population. It took some time for those kind of gaps in terms of the, the employment experience to be redressed and for those employment to population ratios to, to, to rise to where they were at the start of the crisis. But you can see through the recent experience that while it's true that at the start of the pandemic that these minority groups had very weak employment outcomes relative to others, uh, that, that's been quickly redressed and now those kind of employment to population ratios of those minority groups are, are back to where they were um, in, in a relative sense uh, in, in that kind of pre-pandemic period. The, there has been strong nominal wage growth in the US, uh, you know, stronger than we've seen in Europe and stronger than we've seen in many other OECD countries. It seems to be lower income groups that experience the, the, the largest rise in nominal wages and also those that have been switching jobs. So it's almost always true over history that job switches have experienced faster nominal wage growth than job stayers. But the kind of gap in, in wage growth between these two groups is now as large as it's been in any time during which these data are available. Alvaro will talk shortly a little bit more specifically about the different cohorts and their experience with regard to wage growth through the pandemic and in, in the recovery and also kind of put this in a longer term context. So uh, in terms of recent inflation developments, inflation remains very high um, and uh, we've seen in recent months, especially in the October data, inflation seemed to stabilise or the kind of big increases that we've seen in inflation through the first half of 2020 and, and through the middle of the year start to abate. Um, that has had an effect of keeping inflation expectations in check. We can see in terms of medium term inflation expectations of consumers, they've now come down from those very high sort of 4% levels that we saw for the three year ahead inflation expectations to be something closer than 3%, still higher than the Federal Reserve's target of 2%, uh, but, you know, down from where they were, which is a, a positive development and suggests that, you know, that the, 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 the recent moves in monetary policy may help to ensure that inflation expectations have remained well anchored. Financial market inflation expectations that are longer term in nature, 
uh, have kind of remained around the 2% level and, and, and do also continue to, to remain relatively well anchored at present. So on, on top of the positive monthly developments with regard to the October inflation data, when we look at daily indicators of prices for the US uh, using price stats data from State Street, we can say, see that through November so far that prices appear to be relatively flat. So this is a, an, an index of daily movements in inflation. And when we aggregate this up to a monthly level, it tracks quite well the monthly indicators of the, the or the monthly official series. And so we can see even through the middle of November that daily inflation in the US has actually come down somewhat. And so when we look forward, there's various reasons why we may expect inflation to fall further. You know, firstly, some of the sort of supply chain disruptions that we've seen globally and both in the US have abated and started to abate. So that's a positive development when you think about those supply and demand imbalances that are, that, that are occurring. You know, secondly, you know, as the economy slows and it has been slowing so far, we see a further reorientation of demand sort of away from very strong domestic demand growth based on goods uh, where a lot of the inflation has been. Uh, and, and we think that, that some of the capacity constraints that's causing that's feeding into inflation will abate. Uh, I think the other thing is that uh, you know, there are some idiosyncratic factors that have been behind stronger inflation in the US, such as what's been happening with regard to housing inflation, that will start to um, abate as a result of a supply response when you think about a rise in, um, in, in rental dwellings. So the, the Federal Reserve or the Federal Open Market Committee have now increased the federal funds rate by about three and three quarter percent since they started this tightening cycle in March earlier this year. That and also the anticipation of further rate rises has resulted in market interest rates rising sharply. We've seen that have some effect in, in interest sensitive parts of the economy, the housing market being one. Um, we've seen new home sales and, and housing starts weakening. Part of that, I think we would have expected to have happened anyway because of the very strong activity in the housing market through the pandemic, which meant that you know, we would have seen a, a, some weakness in, in housing activity just through the natural course of the cycle as some of that activity was moved into the pandemic times. Uh, but it does seem that interest rates are also having an impact on that particular sector of the economy. Another factor that is that has resulted from the the tightening of monetary policy has been the sharp appreciation in the US dollar relative to the a basket of currencies that reflect the currencies of the US major trading partners. That will be a headwind to export activity going forward. It won't be much of a headwind to inflationary pressures or cause widespread disinflation because of the majority of US exports being invoiced in US dollar terms. So if we look at our projections for the US economy going forward, we have much as Sebastian said, with regard to our projections for the global economy, we have weaker growth in 2022 compared to 2021. Then in 2023, we have growth coming down to around 0.5%, so well below where it's been in recent years and well, well below where we would expect the potential output growth of the US economy to be. Uh, before in 2024, you know, as inflation pressures are based, uh, that we'll see some increase in, in, in the growth rate to around 1%. As the domestic demand economy slows and because of those factors for inflation that I outlined earlier, we expect the, the core inflation in the US to decline through 2023 and 2024. We still expect there to be some persistence in inflation and in 2024, it won't be until the end of the year by our expectations that the core PCA inflation index will start to get back to those levels that are consistent with the Federal Reserve's 2% target. I'll now pass over to Alvaro to talk a little bit about one of the priority level areas of the, of the current administration, uh, the American middle class. Hi everyone. So for my part of the presentation, I'll focus on the impact of the pandemic on, on across the income distribution in the US with a particular focus on the middle class, which was the topic of the latest economic survey of the United States by the OECD, which was published uh, about a month ago. Um, so if we look at uh, wage growth by industry in the US, uh, it's quite clear that the lower wage industries, um, such as leisure and hospitality and trade and transportation, have seen the strongest nominal wage growth uh, since 
uh, mid-2021. Um, this is in part due to issues of labor supply that uh, Ben mentioned earlier, but also the quick rebalancing of spending from goods to services uh, that we've seen over the last year, um, which has resulted in a, in, in a greatly increased labor demand in these sectors. So as a result of this, um, wage inequality in the US has, has fallen since the pandemic uh, due to fa uh, faster rising wages at the bottom of the wage distribution. Um, and what this slide shows um, is that the strong wage growth at the bottom of the income distribution combined with fiscal policy support during the pandemic have outweighed inflation and they've resulted in, in rising real disposable incomes for um, lower wage earners. Uh, for, so for the bottom 50% of the income distribution. Uh, as you know, the federal government expanded unemployment benefits and sent multiple stimulus checks to households across the US. And this pandemic support combined with strong wage growth uh, has resulted in an increase in real disposable income since uh, the beginning of the pandemic, with the real disposable incomes of the bottom 50% having risen 9% by uh, this, the latest data we have is September 2022. But the story is a, a bit different for the middle class. Uh, the middle 40% of households did not benefit as much from strong nominal wage gains. Um, and these gains and the pandemic support were outweighed by inflation, uh, resulting in a fall in real disposable income, uh, which has fallen by slightly more than 1% since the beginning of uh, the pandemic, taking account of inflation. Um, so, so as we show in our recent economic survey of the US, the recent weakness of the middle class is not a new story. In fact, uh, when you look at the income after taxes and transfers for the middle class over the last uh, year since the 1970s, they have um, consistently lagged income growth at the top and bottom of the income distribution. So between 1979 and 2018, the average income after taxes and transfers rose by 53% uh, for the middle class compared to 91% for the uh, lowest quintile and 120% for the highest quintile. Um, so it's quite clear from this chart that middle-class incomes have stagnated over uh, recent decades. And this result is quite robust to different definitions of, of the middle class. Um, on top of sluggish uh, middle middle-class income growth, there's also been, the middle class has also been faced with rising costs of uh, important components of its consumption basket. So while income growth, as we showed before, um, was kind of sluggish over these years, um, the cost of important components such as housing, education, and healthcare have risen steadily. Um, and this is a worrying de uh, development given that, that it can lead to rising indebtedness and it could lead to some households foregoing medical care or education, uh, which could have negative effects for them and for society as a whole. So all of these developments have resulted in the size of the middle class shrinking over uh, recent decades. Since 1970, the proportion of households earning between two thirds and twice the national median income has fallen from more than 60% to 50% uh, between 1970 and 2020. This is uh, also a worrying development because a strong middle class is a foundation to, to a healthy economy and a healthy society. The middle class invests greatly in health and education, supports public institutions and public services. And it also tends to be more entrepreneurial and innovative. Um, and on the other hand, the shrinking middle class can lead to disillusionment, uh, diminished political engagement, and declining trust in public institutions. 
Uh, one uh, major challenge to for the middle class in the U.S. that we focused on in the recent economic survey um, is high the high cost and low availability of childcare in the U.S. as well as the climate transition, which I'll turn to later. Um, on the first challenge, uh, many many of you that have children will be aware that childcare costs are very elevated uh, in America. Uh, in fact, the typical net childcare costs um, in the U.S. are more than twice as high as in the OECD average. Um, and the availability of childcare is also a big issue in the United States. Um, according to some estimates, around half of Americans live in so-called childcare deserts, uh, where it's very hard to find childcare options. So it's not surprising that uh, enrollment in childcare in the U.S. is very low especially compared to the rest of the OECD, um, and it ranks uh, among the lowest. Um, and low childcare enrollment can have important implications, of course. It adds to the parental burden. Uh, it can lead to lower labor force participation, particularly for women. It can lead to parents foregoing um, education to take care of their children. And it can also, of course, have knock-on effects on children's well-being and educational attainment and teacher earnings. So all of this just results in, in lower human capital accumulation overall and uh, weaker economic growth and well-being. As I mentioned, um, the climate transition is another major challenge for the middle class in the US, um, uh, shown in this chart. Households are directly responsible for quite a significant part of uh, total emissions of uh, greenhouse gases in the US. The residential sector alone uh, accounts for roughly 15% of total emissions and transportation accounts for 27%. Um, so the climate transition towards net zero emissions will, will require quite a substantial effort from US households including the middle class uh, to reduce their own emissions. So uh, it will be costly in terms of retro retrofitting their housing, switching uh, the modes of transportation. Um, and, and these costs can, can add up quite, quite quickly. So turning to uh, policy recommendations, um, public investment in childcare uh, in the US is quite low. Uh, it only invests less than 0.5% of GDP per year on childcare and pre-primary education, compared to more than almost 1% uh, for the OECD average, and the difference is even greater if you consider only childcare. Um, federal assistance for childcare is, is, is largely inadequate, um, with only 15% of the children that are eligible to receive subsidies actually receiving them. Um, if to reach lower and middle income children, public funding for childcare would have to be significantly increased. Um, and it's also important to ensure that every child has access to childcare with minimum quality standards and that families can uh, refer to, to a harmonized quality rating system to be able to, to compare different child providers, which can be, which can be complicated for, for households. Um, as mentioned earlier, the climate transition will be uh, quite costly for lower and middle income households. Um, at the same time, we know that emissions are highly unequal with richer households emitting considerably more greenhouse gases than uh, poorer households. So it's important that climate mitigation policies are seen as fair and taking these in inequalities into account. Uh, this requires developing a national strategy with these issues in mind, uh, with programs that help lower and middle income households reduce their emissions without facing prohib prohibitive costs. Uh, thank thanks a lot for listening. That's the end of our presentation. Thank you so much. I'm just taking some notes here because I found some of those elements about the U.S. particularly interesting that I'd like to uh, draw out during the Q&A a little bit. Um, so we have at least one question already from the online um, viewer. So, and I'm gonna tie that into something that I was already thinking about as well. Um, the, 
Uh, one of our uh, viewers, Gregory Massara, says, pardon me, I've lost my question. Here we go. Oh, no, he says you answered his question to a certain degree. But he was talking about how to the extent that you can to highlight a little bit the differences that you see among rural, urban and suburban communities in the US, which I do think that it's interesting to think about um, as you were talking, um, especially about some of these um, effects on cost of living that we're seeing in the United States. Um, I'm a working mom who has two young children. The childcare costs are very real to me. I'm a relatively new homeowner as well. Um, my household benefited from significant tax credits available for solar panels. So there's a lot of things that feel very, very front of mind and I'm not unique. I think that a lot of what you talked about is um, relevant to people across the US. So just to ask if you could talk a little bit more about the real, about the um, component that the person online asked about what you see maybe as a difference for folks that are in rural, suburban and urban areas, and also just what you mentioned about the effect of real wages on purchasing powers. Um, in the US, we just had the Thanksgiving holiday where a lot of people I think have been talking about the increased cost of groceries. Um, we have the holidays coming up, which will not just be you know, shopping, but also the pressure that you're seeing on gas prices in the US. Um, and yet you mentioned that there's a slight drop that you can identify in inflation in the month of November so far. So if you could just talk a little bit about that and how inflation affects different households across the United States. Yeah, okay, sure, I can have a first go and then maybe I'll pass over to Alvaro. So I think that this is a, it's a really good question. I think that uh, it's something that many OECD countries are currently puzzling over as to how to properly you know, reflect these differences in the cost of living um, for different uh, groups within the income distribution and to try and take them, those into account by policymakers. I'd have to say the US is kind of at the forefront. You know, there's, there was some work done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics some years ago um, looking at you know, different, in, different inflation rates based by different parts of the, the income distribution. And the way that they do that is that they kind of take into account the different consumption baskets of different groups within society. It's one thing that we know is that usually lower income groups, you know, have a relatively high share of their consumption is in things like food and gasoline. Uh, so the fact that prices in these particular components have been you know, are stronger than in many other areas of the economy means that they have inflation, they have experienced higher inflation than, than um, than those maybe higher up in the income distribution. And so it's a good thing as we highlighted in the presentation that the kind of nominal wage gains for these lower income groups have been particularly large. Uh, so that to some extent they've been able to offset those higher inflation rates that they're experiencing through those uh, in those items that they consume relatively intensively. It's true as well, and I think this is, this is the case across many OECD member countries, but probably especially so in the US, uh, because of a higher propensity to use passenger vehicles uh, for long distances that, you know, people in rural areas have been, you know, particularly, have partic felt particularly, uh, a particularly pronounced increase in their inflation because of those rises in gasoline prices. And so there are some kind of dimensions between rural households and, and urban households um, in that, uh, in, in that, along that, in, through that component. One of the recommendations that we had in the US economic survey that we published a few months ago was actually that these kind of differential inflation rates for different groups within the economy should be regularly updated by the Bureau of Labor Statistics or another statistical agency and published so that policymakers can kind of take into account these differential inflation effects on different groups. Uh, because at the moment, when we have these public official statistics for aggregate inflation, uh, it, 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 it kind of masks what's happening in terms of the distributional impacts and in terms of the impacts on those different groups in society. I don't know. Yeah, I would add, um, so as Ben said, I think looking at the different consumption baskets of different households is uh, uh, a very direct way of, of looking at how inflation affects different households. But the, the question is a bit more complicated as well. Um, it also depends on the drivers of inflation, right? As Ben um, uh, noted, um, some of the inflation we're seeing is 
uh, due to tight labor markets, rising wages. Um, this wouldn't have the same implications for different households if the if inflation was uh, wholly driven by just supply issues and or energy prices. So the drivers of inflation have different implications too in this sense. And I would also add that um, higher inflation also requires more forceful monetary policy tightening, which can uh, dispor disproportionately hurt uh, lower income households um, by raising unemployment. Unemployment usually starts rising uh, in lower wage uh, industries. Um, so in this way, higher inflation does affect uh, different households also differently. And finally, um, uh, just uh, I think it's important to keep in mind um, that inflation has different effects, not only on income of households with different incomes, but also has um, effects on of di on different. Uh, it can accentuate racial divides. Um, we know that uh, black households face um, more frequent price increases uh, compared to white households, um, and so in this way, inflation can affect different different people also um, through through rates. Mm -hmm. Maybe just give two words from a sort of more global perspective. I mean, these challenges aren't uniquely American, actually. Probably at the moment, the U.S. is maybe under less pressure than other countries in, in Europe. But as Ben says, so one of the things we know that the poor spend a lot, much higher share of their income on, on food and on energy. The other thing is that the poor have much lower savings, right? So the poorer households and well into the middle class, people don't have a lot of cash to pull back on. For the wealthier households, price of plane tickets has gone up. They save a bit less whatever right you know they're not very happy about it but it's life but for other people it really you know people have some people who are facing very difficult choices and the general problem that underlies this as a big policy challenge is, is how to help people without having a lot more inflation now for that you need to target it but it's really hard to target um targeting by income is one thing but for example targeting rural and urban but even within the urban area there might be some people who are driving hundreds of miles every, every week there might be other people who take the bus right the input you know some people are living in apartments some people are living in big drafty houses so it's really really hard for policy to differentiate that so we will you know we're critical of countries for not targeting enough and often they've done it for bad political reasons they rather give a bit of money to everyone uh, and then everyone likes them rather than really targeting at the people who need it but sometimes it's for good reasons as well sometimes it's very hard to reach in Europe, you can often use the benefit system, where you know, in America as well, there are things that are quite targeted. But there's a level of the sort of lower middle class who are under a lot of pressure as well, but wouldn't usually come under those kinds of state programs. So it's a really, really hard problem. And it's so differentiated between different groups. Some older people, another group, old people tend to use a lot more energy in places where it's cold because they're at home all day. Um, but again, it's hard to differentiate between different groups. And within that, you've also got some very wealthy pensioners and you've got some who are really struggling. So it's a really, really difficult social challenge that everyone faces the US, but in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. It's interesting as you describe that, it you know calls to mind, I think a lot of the pressures that were put on during the pandemic um, affected people so differently, depending on whether they were in an industry where uh, you know remote work was possible, where it wasn't possible. And all of these things, it does show you that it's hard to generalize because the, the specifics are very, very important. I have one more question of my own that I think ties into this. And then we have a great question from online. But I just wanted to ask, since you're talking about some of the, you know, the policies that are at play here, what you can say about the effect of the midterm elections. So when we saw you recently for the launch of the US survey, or at least we saw some of you recently, um, it was in the lead up to the midterms and everybody and all of the polling, they were saying, of course, that US voters were worried about the economy and worried about inflation. So I'm wondering you know, what, what you have to say about it now that the elections have come and gone with what were some fairly surprising results for um, a lot of us who were watching. Um, I know that you're not you know, major politicos, but if you could speak a little bit to how you expect the outcomes of the midterm elections to impact the U.S. economy, that would be very interesting. OK, sure, I can say a few words. Um, so I think that's right. We're not, uh, in, in terms of reading the political tea leaves of what happened in the midterms, <laughs> there are people that are a lot better than, uh, uh, a lot more capable than us in that regard. I think with regard to the economic impacts, I think what we can say, 
is that given the new configuration of Congress, it will be more difficult to pass economic reforms to legislate new measures. Um, you know, there, there's obviously different powers between the House and, uh, and the Senate that mean that there will be different actions taken by each of them. I think there's two areas that we're really, we have some concern when we're thinking about 2023 and we're overlaying what we see as being the likely path for economic activity uh, on, on, um, in, in the mind and, and then think about the, 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 um, the challenges for policymakers. The first is with regard to the debt ceiling. I think uh, there are different estimates as to when the US will hit the debt ceiling. Um, uh, and I think with kind of extraordinary measures taken by the treasury, there's an expectation that that's probably likely not to be until the second half of 2023. Um, we do think though, in, when we think about the implications for financial markets and also for you know, currency markets and for kind of global confidence, <laughs> it's important that legislatively that some sort of resolution uh, some sort of compromise is reached so that that debt ceiling is reached within, um, you know, with in, in, in far enough in advance that it doesn't create a big increase in uncertainty at a time when we expect the global economy to be very weak. I think secondly, you know, when we think about 2023, there's a real uh, risk that there's a deeper global downturn of when, than what we have in our base case because of you know, a lot of the uncertainty with regard to what's happening in Europe in terms of energy, but also with regard to the war, also with regard to what has happened already with in the tightening of monetary policy and how that kind of transmits to the real economy in, in, in the US, but also globally. If we were to see a much sharper than expected downturn and a big recession in the US, it's not clear given the new configuration of Congress exactly, you know, that there would be bipartisan support for a stimulus package uh, and there, there would be agreement between the two houses in terms of the components of that stimulus package. And so when you saw, you know, through the pandemic, there was a level of bipartisanship um, with regards to the fiscal stimulus. Uh, one of the real risks is that there is a sharp downturn in the US and there is not general agreement and bipartisan agreement as with regard to stimulus, um, so that the role of fiscal policy and cushioning that impact um, may, be, may be more limited. Well, thanks for that. It is uh, an interesting time. Um, so I have two questions, I think, coming from Ruth Mary Hall online, thank you, uh, that I think are really interesting. And I'll ask them together, even though they're sort of quite separate, but you can think how to answer them. Um, first question is, what are the recession predictions in terms of beginning, length, ending, um, which I guess implicitly asks the question if you see a recession coming. And um, the other question is, where do you see US interest rates topping out or is that just simply unknowable? Do, do, maybe I'll start on the second one and, and, um, and then go to the first one and then maybe we can talk a bit, Sebastian, we can talk a bit more globally about the recession risks. And I should have mentioned this in the presentation. So our forecasts are predicated on the assumption that the federal funds rate is increased to the five to five and a quarter percent range in terms of the target range in early 2023. It's then held at that level throughout 2023 and most of 2024. And then we expect that as inflation starts to get back towards the target band, um, that then that, and that the economy has had a prolonged period of being below what we consider to be the potential output growth level of the economy, that the Federal Reserve will have cause to cut the interest rate by in 25 basis point increments two times in 2024. So based on kind of our assumptions, and this is our kind of most recent reading of the minutes of the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, we have the federal funds rate topping out at five to five and a quarter percent. Uh, I think that, you know, this relates to the uncertainty with regard to what's going to happen with monetary policy in the coming months, relates a little bit to the recession risks that, that um, that, that was, was asked about. So I think that when we think about recession risks, obviously for the US in our baseline, we don't have a significant recession in our projections. But when we think about the recession risks, they probably come from inflation being more persistent than we currently expect. And as a result of that, monetary policy tightening having to be more pronounced than we currently expect. So, uh, so the, the rate topping out at a higher level. 
and that that causes a bigger downturn in terms of output and a bigger increase in the unemployment rate through 2023 and 2024. In terms of the timing of that, you know, there are, there are big lags between when monetary policy actions occur and when they come into effect with regard to the real economy. Uh, you know, we start, we think that we'll start to see a real slowdown through the first half of 2023 in our base case. Uh, you know, if the Federal Reserve had to do more in that early part of 2023 than we're predicting, then we'd start, we'd see weak growth as well in, in going through the second half of 2023 and in the first half of 2024. But there are long lags with regard to monetary policy that are difficult and especially there are various idiosyncratic factors that we can talk about at the current juncture that may be, um, have an impact on those lags. I guess in terms of the global picture, I mean, it's very, very rare that the global economy actually contracts because the emerging economies have a much higher trend growth, so they can slow down and, and for them the slowdown is still positive growth. So if you look overall, we are seeing though, relative to that, it is a pretty strong slowdown and that's driven by the higher energy prices, which kind of net uh, affect everyone um, and also change the distribution of activities. So those countries which tend to consume more and to buy more uh, be in an advanced world uh, are being impacted the most. So we still see, so overall it is a slowdown, it's very hard to get an actual slowdown. If you turn to maybe Europe, which is the other big you know, the, the other big piece in, in the advanced economies, and what, what we actually have there, though you don't quite see it in the annual numbers, is the economy is essentially expected to remain flat, right? So from uh, quarter to quarter volume is expected to be the same through the end of this year and into next year's. So whether it flirts and turns into being a technical recession, where there would actually be a negative number over two quarters to meet the technical definition, where it isn't, is, is, is neither here nor there. It is flat. The economy is very weak, but that doesn't quite show up on the sort of numbers that we put in the forecast table. The real okay. question is, are we going to have a much st uh, steeper slowdown? Now, that could happen for a number of channels. And this is the, the largest conflict on European soil since the Second World War. war Historically, and I think if you go back over centuries, it's a period where things are very hard to predict, very unpredictable, very bad things can happen. So, so that obviously is, is the major risks. The number of other things that could obviously happen uh, and trigger risks. A big question in Europe, is, as in the US, in some ways, is what will happen to inflation and, and to wages. Um, very different story from the US. In the US, you went into the pandemic with already quite a bit of wage pressure. This balance, imbalance between goods and, and services as you came out, and, and as Alvaro showed this big increase in the wages of lower income people hasn't really happened to the same extent in Europe, partly perhaps because we actually had a different structure of support programs that meant that people stayed close to work. So, so there's a number of questions there, but it's an open question how people will respond. I think on the whole, there aren't a lot of signs that people are demanding much higher wages. I think wage growth will be higher than it's been. There's not a sign there's some great spiral that the ECB is likely to need to respond to. But you know, we don't have a lot of data on wages, so it's, it's really hard to tell. And what's going on in wage negotiations, what people are thinking both sides of the table, uh, are things we don't understand very well. So the risks, I think the risks of a global recession are, are, are definitely there. Let's say even in our baseline case, you know, we're not very far away from a recession in the area. There are some countries like Germany and the United Kingdom where we're actually forecasting a, a small contraction. Um, so it is a weak environment, but it could be a lot worse. Huh. Um, thanks for that. Very interesting. Uh, there's another question from online that I'm going to maybe tie into another one of my own again. Um, so Jerry Bracken on the uh, online audience asks, have you looked at long-term aspects of retirement incomes? So you can think on that for a second. And I would also just like to add to that, that you, you know, thinking about, again, households and um, what we saw in some of your slides that you talked about incomes evolving for different households from the beginning of the pandemic. And um, I'd be interested to hear a little bit too about wealth and wealth inequality and the effect you've seen there. So maybe taking the two together, what do you think that this looks like for for aging Americans and for retirement incomes, and also what you see happening in long-term wealth um, growth and wealth inequality in the US. I can talk a bit about uh, wealth uh, developments during the pandemic. <clears throat> so uh, as most of you know, um, after, uh, after a strong decline in, in, in stock prices at the beginning of, the, of 2020, stock prices uh, recovered very quickly um, and they went to new highs uh, over 2020 and the, the first, uh, the beginning of 2021. And when stock prices rise, this usually um, 
uh, is particularly good for wealthier households who hold more stocks and, and financial assets. So during the first half of the pandemic, um, I would say that wealth inequality um, kind of widened. Um, however, uh, as we've seen, um, we've seen strong wage growth at the bottom of the, uh, the distribution. We've seen strong uh, fiscal support, uh, sending checks to, to, to our households. So um, throughout, since 2020, uh, lower wage um, uh, households have been able to accumulate some savings. And at the same time, uh, as most of you know, uh, stock prices have started declining um, quite a lot too, especially since the end of 2021. So in the end, um, it looks like the numbers kind of leveled off um, the, uh, with wealth. So net wealth is negative for the bottom 50%. So uh, we can't really uh, talk about uh, growth rates there. But um, uh, wealth has grown a bit more for uh, the middle class than for the higher wealth households from since 2020. However, you have to keep in mind that this is a small uh, drop in, in the wider wealth inequality in the US, which is very large. And even though uh, wealthier households have done a bit worse, uh, they still hold a much larger proportion of, of wealth in the US. Mm. I mean, I could just talk uh, very briefly. I mean, this is a kind of persistent feature of the US retirement income system that, uh, or just the US social security system that, that, that needs to be addressed. Nothing really specific to the pandemic, but just in terms of the gaps of, in financing. Um, you know, when we go beyond 2030, then there are obviously big gaps that have fiscal implications in the US system uh, that, that uh, if not solved, could have implications for retirement incomes of, of particular cohorts. So you know that's a that's a general thing that um, you know has been well known for many years, uh, but but still needs to be addressed. So I guess that's the 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 main thing that I want to say from the US perspective. I don't know globally if there are. There's, there's a sort of paradox, right? Because asset prices have gone down, interest rates have gone up. So it depends whether you care about your wealth or the or the income. Um, we've obviously been through very unusual times from a financial perspective. Some of which, you know, there's some of the reasons. I mean, though we see interest rates coming up, there's still probably the natural rate is relatively low by historical standards. Now that has the implication on the one hand that asset prices, including housing and land should remain very high, which is good for people who own it because they feel like they're wealthy. Um, and also um, that means that if they cash out, you know, they'll, they'll get a lot of uh, resources in return. On the other hand, it means that yields are very low. Uh, so for people living on the income, uh, that's very, you know, that, that's more of a pressure. So I think there are big questions here. And there's also a question really about how those resources get used. Uh, and I think it's both a US question, but also a global question. And that's partly about open markets and open financial systems. But for example, these investment needs we talked about on energy transition globally are absolutely enormous. Um, and there's a need to fund that both in terms of public debt and also in terms of private debt. So also channeling the investment that we have, avoiding investing in things like, you know, coal and these kinds of things where there's a risk of stranded assets. The financial system needs to manage this very carefully because it is a very complicated environment we're moving into so so i think that also is a big question sort of deeper question on the on the private side you know leaving aside recent stock movements either way uh, really interesting thank you so much for the presentation we're basically at time now so i'd like to just thank everybody for tuning in online and really big thanks to sebastian ben and alvaro for taking the, the time to present today and to give this deep dive on the united states um, in regards to this report. And again, thanks to all of our attendees, especially um, for your questions and comments. As I said at the beginning, we did record today's program. So take a look um, at the email when you get it and you'll find the link to the video. And um, I'd like to encourage you all to follow the OECD Economics Department and OECD Washington Center online, on Twitter, on our newsletters to keep up with all of the, this great information and great presentations. And I hope you felt you learned a little bit today and you can continue to learn as we go into this complicated uh, world ahead as it always seems to be. So thank you so much again. And we look forward to uh, collaborating again on the next briefing. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.